Okay, good morning, guys. Uh, how many of you came for ENS workshop? Okay, how many people just like chilling here? Okay, yeah, so welcome. This is called ENS. So, just in, who has the ENS name? Good, like 30%. Uh, for these people who have a ENS, I have an ENS sticker where you can write down your precious ENS name. It's like, hello, my name is Bra. So you can ask, like, you know, send me East. And you just stick it in the, during the conference. You get rich. And uh, I hope. So today I'm going to talk about, has anyone been to the earlier? There's already two talks in the morning. Who went to the previous talks? OK, nobody. OK. So this one, who's interested in actually integrating? So like, OK. So that's the main audience, but like uh, during the Q&A, if you have a generic question about ENS uh, in the last five minutes, if we have time, feel free to ask, you know, because that was very early. So I, even I wasn't there, so I don't know why he talked. Uh, so let's go. Uh, so yeah, first of all, my name is Makoto, and uh, that's my Twitter uh, handle. And I am also known as uh, something called uh, party app called Kickback, uh, which does like lots of party things. And there's one tomorrow lunchtime. So if you're interested, go to kickback.events. My shilling time is over. And uh, so today, I'm going to talk about basically three things. That first is like when, you know, we often push to like, you know, like ENS adoption and the, inter and the integrating into your DAP is the best ways to adopt. But you, you may not have much idea like what actually that means. So I'm gonna go through like what can you do with ENS to just get, give you some inspiration tips. Then I go to ENS contracts and API overview. Uh, there are lots of code and it's only like 20, 30 minutes. So I don't go through every single detail because it, I'll share this slide. So after a while, like I'll be around the whole Day today, and also I'll be at the ENS uh, Paris Hackathon, so you can grab me and ask more detail. But there, I will probably talk about the, the smart contract structure to give you a brief idea. But actual command line, just you know, read the slide later. And uh, yeah, lastly, some pro tips. Like we do have a. Has anyone does anyone know ENS Manager app we are making? Okay, one. Yeah, so we actually have a front, yeah, two. Hello, good morning, where are you? Anyway, uh, so <laughs> there's a, yeah, DAP, which uses, it helps you to kind of administer your ENS name easier, which is the biggest use case of, you know, lots of cold example of actually integrating with ENS. And there's another guy called Jeff Lau. He does a kind of lead on the front end development, but I also help him out. So like, that's actually the biggest place to learn. And I can kind of share a few tips which uh, might help you uh, go through. So far okay? Yeah? Okay. So what can you do with your ENS? Uh, so there's a four, three steps. Did you know do you guys know this EtherScan stuff? Who has been, who has used e EtherScan before? Half. Okay. Who don't know what EtherScan is? Okay. So other people are just like non-responsive, like I'm too sleepy to interact with you. That's fine. But EtherScan, oh, then how many people actually, you know, like you usually put copy and paste the ECM address, but how many people you actually know that you can search with like a ENS name? One. Yeah, so first way is like, the first way of interacting is like, this is, this is not necessarily the DAP, but any app, like even like if you create a DEX exchange or something, if you are, have someone anywhere you have to specify ENS name, uh, sorry, Ethereum address, you, you should support searching by this name. By the way, matoken.is, that's my, uh, ENS name. So like if you do that, it basically tells you what the address is. So this is the first step. Second step is actually quite less known that one of the questions we, I get asked is like, okay, so you can find out the uh, Ethereum address by looking up ENS name. Can you do the reverse? Uh, answer is yes and no. And I say no faster, like 
in ENS, we don't store the ENS name, for example, matokun.is as is. We actually hash it so that, like, you know, hash turns like a variable length into the fixed length. So you can put like as many, you know, no matter how long your ENS name is, we can fit in. That means when you look at the log and the stuff, it only shows the hash information. So it's really hard to kind of reverse what the information is unless you do the dictionary attack. Uh, what we do have a, is a something called reverse record, which allows user to set tie in what uh, ENS name are associated to this ECM address. So doing the re, you know reverse lookup, and this is one of the example that like uh, uh, before the kickback, we, I used to have a called a block party, and we had the so this is event ticketing up. So like we use it for the ENS workshop and the uh, hackathon we did uh, last year during the summer. And this is just like, you know, say people registered. And most people, like, for example, this is my friend, Ram. Most people just don't have the information, so it just shows the ZX DCC. But if you have a reverse registrar set up, you can, DAP can actually infer what that name was. So I can put my token dot is. Another thing is like, you know, from this area, often people, like once you sign in, you, ha you might have your avatar or something. Rather than showing 0x blah, blah, blah address, you could actually put the ENS name. That, so that's kind of second level of integration. And the one extra thing we, we did is uh, we, we knew people's ENS name up front. So when people register using that, we actually like a, a custom, custom printed every participant's uh, ENS subdomain and we put in a t-shirt. So like uh, I have this premium t-shirts where my back says like matokun.is. Like, Everywhere, so like I'm automatically shitting my ENS name. So that's uh, the usage. And the third one uh, is uh, uh, giving subdomain. Uh, who has used Gitcoin? Oh, one. Interesting. Who don't know Gitcoin? Twenty percent, I think. So Gitcoin is a bounty system, uh, kind of tied in with like, uh, who don't know GitHub? Okay, one. So GitHub is like a, do you know Facebook? Yeah, okay, so it's a social network, right? So social network for coders. And when coders write a program, they submit into this Facebook for GitHub. And uh, what Gitcoin allows is like it puts a bounty that if there's some bugs or some issues, they put, you, GitHub only does like, you know, hey, here is an issue. But Gitcoin kind of integrates this GitHub that, they can say like, hey, if you help me help in this issue, I'll give you coin. And uh, it, often it could be ETH, Ether, or it could be DAI. And uh, they actually, as part of the onboarding, not as part of onboarding, I think, they say like, you know, and they also they do create a username based on their GitHub profile ID. And if you do have it, they will actually let you create uh, makoto.gitcoin.is. So this is a kind of final stage like, which really help uh, ENS adoption as well as like, a, I often tell them that this is a hotmail moment. That imagine people shitting their e ENS, you know, when they show their ENS name, if it's a subdomain of your app, they're shitting you, your app as well. It's like in the hotmail, how hotmail like spread, well, like in the Makoto, email me at makoto.hotmail.com. Oh, what is this Hotmail thing, right? And then, oh, our ENS, uh, Ethereum is still the early days, like, you know, early 90s, you know. So, like, uh, that's something we usually encourage. And uh, so that was uh, kind of three things you should be using uh, for the ENS, like, six months ago. This is pretty much the same as what I presented at DevCon 4. But Ethereum world, like, you know, really, really move fast. So, like, there's a few other things coming up. The idea four is, how many of you guys know universal logging? Universal logging? Yeah, it's written here, universal logging. Uh, so, you, how many knows idea? So, like, this is the idea that, like, if you are interested, uh, there's a talk uh, day three, one thirty in somewhere, so you can get into more detail. But this one is the hybrid of so many advanced idea that it's basically using uh, 
uh, ENS subdomain as a universal login. It's almost like OAuth. Like when you say, like, you know, do you log in as like Twitter or Facebook? You say, do you want to log in with ENS subdomain of which given by these, uh, you know, top level domain like, you know, Aragon or like a Gitcoin could, if they integrate, when they do sign up, you use ENS name. And the next time you, you go to other app, you could log in with that. That's one idea. And also, it comes with the idea of like a uh, smart contract as multisig. So one of the user UX problem is that if, uh, like everybody, who has MetaMask? Yeah, so like, you know, in the MetaMask account, it, it, it has an account as well, it holds the funds, right? So like if that get hacked, you lose it. So the idea is rather than each end, Endpoint key pair has a fund. Let's put that in a multisig as a smart contract. And each, so for example, a MetaMask or a, a other wallets or can just be the kind of one of the multisig key to authenticate or deny. So like if you have like you know uh, lose your phone or something, if you if you let multiple device to be connected to this universal login, you could do social recovery or to in you know, multi-factor authentication. That's another idea. To make it possible, another keyword you have to understand is something called a uh, meta transaction. That now the account doesn't have any ease, so you have to sub someone has to pay the gas for that. So like there's a whole idea of like how would you abstract? Once that happens, people could uh, start using the ease. We sell. Uh, the idea is that people could actually pay the gas not in using ETH, but you could use any ERC20 token or DAI. So these whole, like, last six months of progress, it's kind of summarized into this universal login. So I highly recommend if that, my three minutes of a pep talk interested you, goes to, uh, yeah, another event. So that's another new thing. Uh, number five is decentralized web with DAP node, another talk, 425. So I think I just filled you all the schedule today for you. So, and so that idea is, I get often asked, so like many people think ENS name is like something, something dot ETH. And they often I get asked questions like, oh, can you set IP address associated to ENS name? The, my answer usually is, you could technically can, but there's not much point. But instead, what we usually recommend is like, a, who knows IPFS Swarm? Okay. Yeah, so if you have IPFS Swarm, like, you know, you, it has a, like a content hash, right? Then you can, rather than putting E, e uh, so e ENS, if I have my token dot is, one thing is there's an API called set ADDR to set uh, Ethereum address. But there's also another field called set content hash where you can get, put the, these Swarm IPFS endpoint. And now something like a DAP node uh, allows you to point to uh, this static asset using dot is name. So that's, if you wanna get into this one, go to this talk, but even if you, so this is something I think you have to install the node on, on something or something, uh, some like box or something, but without doing that already, so this is a new standard that it recently oops, came out. It's called EIP1577, which is a new ways to, so one thing, are you guys with me? Who's not with you? No, not with you, with me. Okay, so basic idea is ENS's primary role is to resolve ECM address. So there's a ways to set address, but there's also ways to set content. That, that was the initial spec, and people start just had putting the uh, Swarm or IPSS hash into this field. Problem is, it's hard to see whether this is Swarm or IPFS, so that DAP or like an end wallet to integrate had no idea which one to resolve. So to uh, overcome the uh, issue, we came up with a new standard called EIP1577, which has the, uh, basically, the, this protocol allows you to prepend the uh, protocol information, prepend, 
and then put content hash. So we, as a DAP, you can decode and see, oh, this is swarm. So hence, you point to this, that kind of stuff. And uh, has anyone been to the Opera's talk? You know, Opera browser? One. Yeah, so, so you, you know like now Opera supports the .eth address of both the old format and new format. So if you support that, you can have like matoku.s as a website. Not pointing to IP address, but pointing to your Swarm or IPFS hash. So I think this is an area which could be more interesting. <coughs> because again, then if you combine with this, uh, the DAP node, you, you could actually have the whole things resolved without even having like uh, internet, I think. Okay, and uh, I think this is kind of number six, is who's into big data? Two, three, four. Yeah, so, you know, Ethereum is a public kind of data ledger, so all the data is exposed. So there's lots of like data science company, big data companies, uh, in trying to find out new data to explore. And, uh, but trying to run your own node and uh, try to index each event on yourself, by yourself, takes lots of infrastructure investment. But there's some one like uh, the graph protocol. Uh, yeah, the graph. They already do the indexing for you. And they even create, uh, who knows GraphQL? Yeah. So GraphQL is, uh, it's kind of, no, it's not SQL, but like it's a query language which allows you to kind of query things. And there's something called subgraph, which will define the schema information, just like in SQL, you know, there's schema, there's a GraphQL format. And they did that and they, they do index and they actually define these schema for a couple of known uh, dApps such as like LivePeer or Dharma, all the stuff, and the ENS is one of them. So you can already uh, basically query the information using this graph explorer. So if you want to explore the data set and try to find out interesting data set, uh, this is the one. Especially that, like, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys know, like, you know, uh, to get the uh, ENS domain, it's auction. And the auction, like, you know, we have always a discussion, like, who's the squatters, all the stuff. Maybe using this data, you could explore, like, some interesting data set. And uh, yeah, so idea 999, who's going to East Paris? Two, yeah, so, but East Paris is just a one of its global event. And uh, I, I don't know if we, got, we announced, but like now we are sponsoring uh, all the East global events. So the next one is coming, who's going to escape town? Yeah, zero, okay. No worries, but like, there will be one in New York, India, Boston, and more to come, I think. So if you go there, there's a, yeah, a, you know, ENS teams, and there's a, some small prize, all the stuff. So like, now, once you get hopefully inspired, time to apply one of these, okay? So that's the kind of idea stage. And what's the time? Is it how many more minutes? 10 more minutes? 10? Okay, cool. So now is kind of dry part, but uh, for the next five minutes is basically if you are really interested, we just uh, wrote the whole new doc. And actually, this is wrong domain. I think if you go to docs, ENS, doc, domains, there's a whole uh, things there. So one, one takeaway from this talk is write it down or take a photo of docs.ens.domains and go there. And if you have questions, grab me, okay? But like the, this one is up, yeah, just quite up to date one. So like it would be good. And also, has anyone seen old doc? No one, one, yeah. You, knew, you know like that was written like back in 2017 or something. So the under the assumption is that you have everything on your the entire blockchain on your local uh, laptop. Because it, like first thing is like, hey, startup guess and they sync in full. Last time I did it was 2016. So that was a quite hard, hard to even start. But this time now, like it's very modern, updated. And so, and it, it has a reference in uh, various uh, 
libraries like Web3.js, Ethel.js, uh, Web3.j, Web3.py, that kind of stuff. So whatever the tool you choose, they should be easier to find. And uh, so this is an architecture that ENS is actually one of the oldest smart contract on live since 2017 made a force. So this is going to be the history of Ethereum. You know, if you have the pop coins, when like ENS was launched, uh, 2017 made a force be with you. That's how you remember. And the, the new registration is also uh, 2019's made a force be with you. Yeah, so that, and uh, when it's first deployed, uh, basic is ENS, the entire contract is just a dictionary. You know, there's a key and there's a value. If you pass a key, it returns value. So it's the same. Uh, and the one is called uh, ah, registry. But if we, uh, simple, but like, you know, all these new things are evolving, right? And uh, also we know that like a smart contract is some sort of immutable immutable thing, so once you deploy, it's, it's bloody hard to kind of swap around. So the simplest, simplest approach to make uh, upgradable, make it upgradable is the registry doesn't have the logic to resolve how to, you know, look up, but register, sorry, register, register? Uh, yeah, registry only has the information of the key to look up pointing to something called resolver. Resolver has a whole logic of how to look it up. So like when you first see it, the registry, and this is important, especially you are kind of passing events of ENS things, because uh, for example, like uh, there's lots of like, you know, uh, popular DAP dashboard, and the ENS, you might think it's not as active. It's because they are only looking at the events of the uh, registry, but registry only has a partial information. The lots of logic of, you know, what address being set, what content has been set is actually in this uh, resolver address, which can be uh, swappable uh, depending on what you want to do. And that's uh, one important thing. And uh, yeah, so this is a flow that like, uh, you, first you user asks like, you know, hey resolver, I want to look up this who dot e is. And the registry only returns the address of the resolver. Then you ask the resolver like, what is the address of the this thing, then in return. So it's like a two step, which has a bit of like a downward UX uh, side effect that like a, in our ENS manager, it says set resolver. And the most user like, what the hell is resolver? But uh, this is what it is. And uh, yeah, so this is a resolver example. This is the simplest case that it just says like, a, this is like most CDS resolver, like whatever you put, you put return like your address. In reality, it has no sense, but like, this just kind of shows like interface over there's something called ADDR, which, yeah, that's the interface. And uh, I'm gonna go through this part very quickly because I think I'm running out of time. And yeah, JavaScript, I said, like, it supports so many different libraries. And uh, this is, yeah, that actually is a call to get the address. This is uh, like basically the, uh, step one to enable it. You don't have to understand it, just read the doc later. And the reverse resolution is uh, this syntax. But interesting about reverse resolution is inside it's just another uh, namespace. So we already know that there's a domain TLD called ETH. The hidden secret is there's another secret domain called dot reverse. And the way it's actually setting the a reverse record is actually using uh, your Ethereum address dot ADDR dot reverse, and you just add in uh, the ENS name as a value. So you're just using the same hierarchy, but like it's just hiding underneath. And that's how reverse record works. Oh yeah, one thing, one, yeah. Uh, and this is how to set reverse. And this is uh, contra, uh, yeah. Uh, interesting thing is, you, has anyone used like my crypto or a Mew to interact with smart contract? Yeah? Yeah? Good. Like now you guys are raising your hands and we start asking. That's great. I like that attitude. Uh, so it's quite annoying, isn't it? Like you just pick the address and then you have to copy and paste uh, the ABI address, right? So you can actually put that information within the ENS. So like, it, uh, I think, I think that's what it does. It's contract. Yeah. So you can do that with that. 
So test contract ad address, it, it kind of returns an uh, interface or something. Oh no, this one. Then it has a dot instance interface. But again, read the doc. Uh, this one is very long, so I'm gonna just skip. Uh, yeah, it's five minutes, I think. Uh, I just only show you that what the, one of the user interface looks like, and I'll skip the whole code underneath. Is that like a, so? This is a company called Zinc, which is, I think it's like a LinkedIn for like Web3 world. And uh, how they do is they use issue ENS subdomain name as part of the uh, user onboarding. That like you know when you first log in, it asks you to like hey, uh, account will be created. What kind of name you want? And you just type it in, and uh, you put more detail, and you sign it, and blah blah blah, and you get the name. So one of the design consideration is, do you actually want to do it? And why? What's the reason against not doing? Any idea? is that sign up is the biggest, the hardest place in terms of user onboarding, right? Like it, when people say sign up, most people, half of the people drop off. Then you are, and if you have to get subdomain, and if user have to pay the gas, you have, you know, people have to have an ETH address, all that stuff. So that's going to be huge implication on user onboarding. So someone like Zinc, they actually use some sort of like flavor of meta transaction that they actually extracted uh, the gas of the user, so they pay for the gas, and I, I believe that's done by uh, Gitcoin as well. So if you try to just create it, I'll, I'll warn you that, that you know, the user drop uh, dropout goal will be very huge. That's just a tip, and uh, yeah, that call tip, blah, 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 you just read it later, boom, 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 done. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Understood? Easy peasy, right? Okay. So the last bit is a bit of pro tip. Uh, yeah, creating your test ENS name. Yes. So whenever I go to the so last year at DevCon, when we did a similar uh, workshop, and then one of the hurdle is like, uh, okay, who's who has an ENS name? Yeah, so half, right? So the, when you go to a workshop, like more than half the people don't have an ENS name. And if you don't have an ENS name, then it's hard to get. And you could buy subdomain if you go to now.ensdomain.com. No, ens.domains. But if you actually want to have that name, actual name, you, have to, you still have to go to seven days or uh, auction process, which is a pain. And you can't do it during the workshop. So... What it allows is that, yeah, so this is a manager ENS if you don't, you've never visited it. But like, so if you connect it to the test net, uh, this one says, I think Ross Ben, you actually have a test uh, TLD called dot test. And this one is like a, just a fast come, fast solved. And uh, I don't know if you can read, but like any, if it's not, yeah. So this is interesting. So if it's owned, uh, anyone can own it. But after 30 days, it kind of allows anyone to claim. So like I don't want like squat that to just test it once and leave it forever. So in this case, I already have makoto.test and set the owner and resolve all the stuff. But that I did it like last year. So it's expired. Once it's expired, anyone can claim just by clicking this, this button. So if he wants to play around, but you, you know, even adding subdomain and stuff, it costs gas and it, it's not fun to keep losing loads of money for just testing purpose, then just do it using the dot .test domain. It's free. So it's a, yeah, there's not so many free things in this world, but this is free for everybody. Yay. Uh, and yeah, so another thing is like, uh, you know, you guys, what framework do you guys use? Truffle? Uh, Embark? Zero. What else? Sorry? Oh, he was just chatting. Uh, yeah, so most of the people have some sort of test framework, and when you test, you probably use something like Ganache, which is an in memory database. And these in memory database doesn't have ENS. 
uh, built in. So you kind of have to deploy, right? Like, so if there's a couple of solutions to allow it, that uh, yeah, this is something like an ENS builder, which is built by the guys who create is building the universal logging. Because universal logging has to have an ENS whenever they do development, they already have some sort of library which I never used. So just use it and let me know how good or bad. But uh, ENS will allow you. And also, yeah, so this is an M, uh, Embark. Embark uh, have ENS built in, actually, as a part of, uh, so I think they deploy in a memory database. So like it, as a, in the configuration files, it already lets you to specify you know, your root domain and all that stuff. So if you, again, I haven't used uh, Embark, but try it out, it might be good. And let me know. Okay. Uh, I think we, is it end or? Yeah, so like I was gonna quest. So yeah, reference, uh, we, we write a lot about things in medium, doc space is the most important, and also, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, last thing, So last thing. Uh, so the reason I don't use Embark is all the, so one important thing, which I didn't even know when I first got to know ENS is I thought ENS is such a core infrastructure. So it's almost like a you know, guess or uh, whisper, like it, it's some developer tool, but it's actually just a smart contract, right? So if these, some of the end library, Web3.js or ESA.js may not have all the features which we described, in that case, you can just go to the smart contract and you can inquire. You can go to like, you know, my crypto mu and just interact directly or also, it's both, all the contract is just, uh, we also uh, deploy as using Truffle and we publish it in, in PEM package. So you can actually just, uh, when you deploy, uh, yeah, deploy contract, you can just do uh, artifacts that require in Truffle. Then if you put the, you know, this one, it, you can actually just deploy. Uh, and I think ENS Builder is to pack, wrap it up. And also when you call from ESJS, you can call it from this one. So there's one uh, command in uh, npm package to run certain build script up front, which we do. So when it happens, uh, Truffle, usually when you compile the smart contract, it creates a JSON artifacts in the, in the build directory. That's already in the npm package. So rather than ha don't hard code ENS interface or anything into your project, just like, uh, you know, include it using NPM. So that's a recommended way. That's it. Any questions? Oh, thank you. Do you have question time or? Do you have time for question, couple? One. One. Whoever shouts first. Ah, uh, actually, but yeah. Sorry, uh, I think you need a mic. Yeah, so whoever she's going to pass it on. <laughs> she has a whole responsibility. <laughs> oh, you guys are nice. Like, you ask. Whoever has a, who has the best question? Make it count. Make it interesting. It's just a basic question. I just want to know, do you have a place where you reference the uh, resolvers, the, the latest uh, we should use or something like that? Great question. Thank great, you. great question. So if you go to manager.ens, first thing is that you, you know, you, if you go to matoken.xyz, uh, sorry, not ETH, uh, there's a place to set resolver. There is a link to say, click default, uh, click the default resolver and it pops up the one which uh, we use as a standard, which happened to be is just like a, has an ENS name called resolver.s. So like, it, you know, we, we just eat our own dog food, so they just look up resolver.s, which has a default latest one. And, and then, so another thing is, resolver has different types. If you go to the, revol uh, so some resolver might have a different interface, but if you go to the Resolver uh, GitHub project, I created a one JSON file which has an aggregation of different ones. So if you want to have one UI which cater for different Resolver, you, you, you should use that one. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.